So we've been in this series that I've been really excited about called Unconditional. In life, most of the things that we get in life are based on our merit or based on something you've done. And that is what's so extraordinary about following Jesus is that he gives us these unconditional gifts. And so we've been unpacking those gifts these past weeks. Today, I'm talking about this amazing topic, unconditional access unconditional access. I don't know if you've ever been given access to something that you know you didn't deserve. A few years back, my favorite comedian was coming into town and some of our friends invited me and Steph and said, hey, do you guys want to get tickets with us and we'll all go to this together? And we said yes, until we looked at the cost. And we went, oh, in this season, we just can't afford it. So I was pretty bummed, and the night of this concert, so it was, it's a Christian comedian, so they were packing out one of the biggest church buildings in the whole county. That night, I was hearing about numerous ones of my friends getting ready to go, and so I was a little bummed about it, but I was doing my daddy duties. I was driving my daughter home from a practice when she gets a call, and her friend starts talking to her, and, and her friend's like, I hear Hallie going, yeah, I'm not doing anything tonight. And, and her friend says, well, I know it's late, but I have a free ticket for this concert to go to. And she says the comedian's name. And so Hallie turns to me and goes, Dad, have you heard of this person? I've just been invited. And I went, yes. <laughs> and then she goes, oh, really? And she turns to me and goes, Dad, she has another ticket. Do you want to go with me? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and then she says this. So then she, put, she puts her friend on speakerphone. And her friend says, don't come to the front of the auditorium. She goes, go to the backstage and we'll let you in there. And so we drive there. Well, her friend was the granddaughter of the pastor that leads this big church. And so we go to the backstage. The executive pastor is waiting for my daughter and me. And <clears throat> he leads us through the backstage and on to the front row sitting in the family section. And so I'm sitting down, I'm in heaven. I look up to the balcony where my friends are and just wave at them. <laughs> and I had a great time. Even more than enjoying the comedy show, I loved the unconditional favor I got to experience. And I want to tell you that you have even more unconditional favor than that in the kingdom of God. This is what Hebrews 4 says. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us, and this is the crux of the whole message right here, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Do you understand that you can approach the throne of grace with confidence? Imagine that you're having problems just in your everyday life. I'm seeing Hudson. Happy birthday, Hudson Bartell. I just got to say that real quick. Uh, um, imagine that you're having problems in your life Maybe your taxes are a little too high. Maybe you don't like the gas prices. Maybe you're having problems with a cantankerous neighbor. And you just have the ability to go straight into the Oval Office and ask the president to make a decree. All right. Do you know that you have more than that in the kingdom of God? Greater than any earthly king more powerful than any earthly president, is the God of the universe who says that you can approach his throne of grace with confidence. Why? Not because of anything that you've done, but what Jesus has done for you. Look at what Hebrews 10, 20 says. It says, by his death, Jesus opened a new life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. It's not by what you've done. 
It's by his death. Now, what's this curtain into the holy place? Well, in the Old Testament, there was a temple, and that is where God's presence dwelt. And if you wanted to meet with God, you went up to the temple in Jerusalem. Now, everyone could go and visit the temple, but there was a curtain, and that curtain was about 50 feet tall. It was eight feet thick, and only one person one time of year, could go behind that curtain. It was the high priest, the chosen man of the whole country. And even when he did that, they actually had to put bells on the bottom of his robe and they put a rope on his ankle because you could not sin in the presence of God. And so if he just went in and had a bad thought, he dies. And they needed a rope to pull his body out. That's how precious and privileged it was to go and stand before the throne of grace. And what does it say? It says, because Jesus died, that veil, that curtain was ripped in two. And we all have access to go in because of what he did for you, not because of what you do for him. Perhaps you've heard the story before of the country town where a rebellious and destructive teenager lived. He had been picked up eight or nine times already by the sheriff's department, but this time superseded them all. He had, in the past, got picked up for shoplifting. He got picked up for stealing from people. He had got picked up. He was a nasty kid. He had got picked up for terrorizing his different friends and, and family members' animals. But this time, he had actually gone, gotten drunk, and stolen a car, Grand Theft Auto. And then he wrecked his car in the center of town near the town pride and joy, the county seat, the county courthouse. And in his anger for how many times he got in trouble, he broke through a window, drew graffiti all over the walls of the courtroom and absolutely destroyed the judge's bench. And so when it came time for his court proceeding, the whole town showed up. They wanted justice. And so they're sitting in there waiting to see this young man who had hurt so many of them and made a mockery of the town brought to justice. Now this young man was hated by most, but he did have one friend. This one friend had compassion on this rebel rouser. And the reason he had compassion is because he had been adopted. He had been adopted, and so he knew what it was like to be given a second chance. And so as the courtroom is packed, this young man knew he needed to do something. And so he went to his father and said, Father, can't you do something for my destructive friend? Well, that wouldn't have seemed to matter except the one who was his father was the judge himself. Well, the prosecuting attorney's pacing around, he's snarling, he's getting the whole crowd, much like a room like this, up in arms, and he's going through all the different sins that that young man had committed, all the different people he had hurt. And then he said, look around this courtroom. The courtroom hadn't even been cleaned up completely from all the damage he had done. And after he finishes his case, it's time for the judge to make his sentence. And so the judge, with reluctancy and grief, goes, because of all the evidence against you, young man, I have no other recourse except to fine you for all the damages you've done. And he gives him the fine over $100,000. The boy knows that he'll be spending years in jail. He could never pay that fine. His foster parents could never pay the fine. And the boy just sinks, and the townspeople are just giddy and starting to cheer. The judge then hits his hammer. The case is over. The adopted son can't believe it. He just sinks his head. The townspeople get up, and they start just pouring out of the courtroom. They've won. And so very few saw what would happen next because the judge stands up, he removes his robe, he puts down his gavel, and he walks around to where that young destructive man is sitting. And he said, son, this is why I'm doing this. He pulls out his checkbook and says, I'm writing a check for $100,000 to the county. Your fine is paid in full. 
that rebellious kid just starts weeping. The adopted son just starts weeping. And the few people that were left in the courtroom would never be the same. My question is, who are you in that story? We all know that we're actually that destructive son. The Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This week, I was sitting at one of my son's football games, and I was sitting up in the stadium, and I, 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 there's a, a young woman sitting next to me, and we just start making conversation, and I end up telling her, yeah, I've been working with young people for years, and she says, what do you do? And I end up saying I'm a pastor, and she goes, oh, I go to a church. And, and, and I thought, well, this is a good opportunity to ask her. So I said, so here's, here's like the million-dollar question. If you died tonight, like I don't want you to, but if you're driving home on the way back after this game and you got hit by a drunk driver and you die, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? He said, no, I'm not. I said, well, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that there's appointed a time for everyone to die and then you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So that will, I don't want you to die, but someday you will, and you're going to stand before Jesus. What are you going to say? She's like, ah, I don't know. Maybe I pray. I was like, but that's not good enough. I said, have you ever cheated? She goes, yeah. I said, have you ever lied? Yeah. Have you ever thought a bad thought? She's like, yeah. I said, then you have sin in your life. I have sin in my life, right? Yeah. I said, can sin be in the presence of a perfect God? No. So, what are you going to do? And I said, it's like you're on one side of a cliff and God's on the other. There has to be a bridge. And then I drew the cross. And I said, what happened on the cross? She said, he died. I said, who? Jesus. And I told her this verse, this verse out of Ephesians chapter two, it says, and God raised up Christ and seated us in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparably great riches expressed in this kindness to Jesus Christ. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. Say not from yourselves. Not from myself. It is the gift, say gift, yes. of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Jesus gave you a gift when he died on the cross, and he is the one who made a way. And I told her, so how do you accept a gift? You receive it. How do you receive this gift? By confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, by believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Then the Bible says you will be saved. And I asked, are you ready to do that? And she said, yes. We're in the middle of a football game on the top row of the bleachers. And so right now, there, we pray. She goes, would you, would you let me pray after you? I said, absolutely. So we prayed. She gives her life to Jesus in the stands. And I turned to her and said, how do you feel? She said, I feel great. Why? Because point one today, we're talking about unconditional access, but point one is this. He gives unconditional access because he wants to be with us. He wants to be with us. Why did Jesus die to pay for your sins? You could never be good enough. None of us could ever be good enough. We needed his sacrificial death on the cross, but it's actually because he wants to be with you. He wants to be close to you. He wants to be near you. This is what the scripture says. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter into the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain. That is his body. And let me just pause for a second. So what happens? Remember, I told you about this temple and then the most holy place with this curtain, an eight inch thick curtain, 50 feet high. This is what the scripture says in Matthew 15. When Jesus died, it says with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Why does it say top to bottom? Just so we can know no person did it. It was God. He was tearing that veil so that you could go in and be with him. You have unconditional access to the presence of God. No longer is it one priest that can go in one time a year after he's done all the ceremonial cleansing and sacrificed animals. No, you can go in by what Jesus has done for you. He wants to be with you. 
But here's my next point. Secondly, he gives us unconditional access so that we can get the blueprints for what he wants to do on earth. Now, God wants to be with you. But when you actually go and be with him, first of all, he's, he loves on you. But second of all, he shows you things. The scripture says, call to me, and I will answer you, and I'll show you great and marvelous things, things that you didn't know. We're not just in a religion. We are with a living God who wants to show us things. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. When Jesus was healing people, when he was drawing poor people near, when he was forgiving people caught in all kinds of sin, he was just doing what the Father was showing him. I want you to see this right here, Exodus 24. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron and Nabad and Abahu and 70 elders of Israel. You are to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near and the, and the people may not come up with him. Now, the next chapter, it says this. What, what happens when he goes near? It says, then have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. See, he always wants to be with us. But look at this, make this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Okay, why is this significant to you? Well, first of all, the only reason we're gathered in this room today at a church called All Peoples is because God shows us what he wants to do. And I was living four states away in, in the nation of Texas and, <laughs> and just praying, God, is there something you want to do? And God spoke very clearly plant a church in San Diego, California. Plant a church that plants churches, a multi-ethnic church. Well, here it is, 15 years later. God had a plan, and God wants to be that specific with all of us. Now, do I hear something that specific every day? No. But so often, it's, it's call this person, or encourage this person, or, or reach out to this person, or do this, or go here, or God doesn't want us to just blindly stumble around. He loves to give blueprints and plans to his people, All right? He wants to show some of you who to marry, and that'd be a great day. He, he wants to show different ones of you what your career is supposed to be. He wants to show you maybe where to live or, 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 or what, what neighborhood to be in. He tells us who to reach out to. He, he, he is always unpacking his blueprints to us. So that's why we don't just go into our, our time of prayer and just like, Lord, you know, I, I just, I pray for my Aunt Susie today and I pray for Uncle John, pray for my pet fish and Lord help my cat and help me not get indigestion today. And you know, it's not, it's also you wait and you listen and we're all growing and learning to hear him speak. Thirdly, third point, I only have three today, We're moving fast. He gives us unconditional access so that we can intercede for people and shape history. He gives us unconditional access so that we can intercede for people and shape history. Okay, now we're going to do a deep dive. Okay, but I think everyone's going to be able to understand this. But we're going to go to the book of Amos one of the least preached books in the Bible. Amos lived in a time where the people of God, the Israelites, had been very rebellious. They had been prideful. They were in all kinds of idol worship. They hadn't been doing what God had called them to. And so God actually rebukes them and says, so I'm, I've got to punish this wickedness that you've been in. So let's check this out. In Amos chapter 6, verse 8, it says, the sovereign Lord has sworn by himself the Lord God Almighty decrees, I abhor the pride of Jacob and detest his fortresses. I will deliver up the city and everything in it. So God is being like that righteous judge who said over that rebellious young man, you're getting fined. Like you're getting punished for all the things that you've done. Now watch, we move to the next chapter. Watch what Amos, Amos was a shepherd. Amos was uneducated. But God has always used ordinary people that he speaks to, to believe and to speak out his word. So watch this with Amos. This is what the sovereign Lord showed me. He was preparing swarms of locusts after the king's share had been harvested. And just as the late crops were coming up, when they had stripped the land clean, I cried out, sovereign Lord, 
forgive. How can Jacob, or Jacob's another word for Israel here, how can Israel survive? He is so small. Watch this next phrase. So the Lord relented. This will not happen, the Lord said. This is what the Lord showed me. The sovereign Lord was calling for judgment by fire. It dried up the great deep and devoured the land. Then I cried out, Sovereign Lord, I beg you, stop. How can Jacob survive? He's so small. So the Lord relented. This will not happen either, the sovereign Lord said. Are are you following me? God is saying, because I'm a righteous judge, it is right and full of integrity and full of justice. Like we want God to be just. So he's like, so because of this, I'm gonna be just and I'm gonna bring a punishment. And then little Amos, the sheep farmer, says, but Lord, no, please don't. They're too small. They can't take it. I know they've messed up, but please stop. And God says, okay, I relent. I won't give them what they deserve. Are you following us? We all are like that rebellious, destructive kid who's messed up so many times and made a mockery of of, of our heavenly father and deserved punishment. And so we all can relate when we learn that the judge then takes off the robe and says, I'm paying the price for you. And that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross. He paid the debt that you could never pay. But God wants us to move from that place of just going, I'm just thankful, I can't believe. I mean, we never never leave that gratitude, but God's saying, I also want you to be like that adopted kid who understands I've been adopted by the judge. And so dad, I know my friend doesn't deserve it, but dad, please, I don't want them to go to hell. Dad, please, like, I know I don't deserve it. I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm no better than that kid, but please, Dad. And then the judge says, then I'll step in front. I'll pay the price. I'll take in your friend. I won't just pay the price. I'll invite those friends to come in and live with our family, to come in and actually take his home in the judge's beautiful living room and give him his own bedroom. That's what God does for each of us. And he's calling us to be the adoptive kids who start interceding and say, God, please, on behalf of my friends at work, Lord, I don't deserve salvation any more than them, but please save them. For my friends at school, please save them. For my neighbors, for my family, oh Lord, please save them. Bless them, let them know the abundant life of living in your kingdom. Matthew 16, I love this, 16, 13 through 19, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets, but what about you, Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. By what Jesus did for you. And your confession that he is the Son of God, that he is the Lord of lords, He's actually saying, that's the true church. And I'm gonna build my kingdom through people like you. And you're actually gonna have authority. You're gonna be given the keys to change people's lives. So I, I, um, I, I told you we spent a lot of time in the football, you know, stands watching football. Uh, <clears throat> my son had to, to change schools because... Uh, of a change of address, so, so we felt led to be at this one school. And he was playing, and he, I mean, he loves football, and it, it went bad. Um, last year, their team went 0 and 10. Um, if you don't know sports, that means they lost a lot. <laughs> like, really lost. 
Like, no wins. And um, I remember my son coming to me and going like, because I, I was, I, at the time I was preaching on the life of Joseph. And Joseph actually gets sold into slavery and like put in a pit. And he's like, he came up to me after the service. He's like, dad, I'm Joseph. Like, I'm the football Joseph. And I'm like, yeah, you are, son. But remember that God took Joseph from the prison and, and, and gave him authority to transform lives. Joseph, Joseph in Genesis 50, 20, it says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for the saving of many lives. And so I said, son, we're just gonna keep praying for God to do something. And then one of his friends gave his life to Jesus in the spring here. And then a couple more friends that were believers came in. And I said, we're just gonna, we're gonna pray. And I want to show you from the first game on the 50-yard line, when kids usually go out to meet each other, this is what the captains of the football team did. They got together. This is, all, this, this is the captains, and they're together praying. In fact, they, they prayed a little too long, where I was like, go, go, like, get in the game. Stop praying. Um, and, I, and I talked to this kid, and I said, hey, man, way to go. Like, way to gather your friends and, and start praying. I'm so proud of you. And he goes, you know what I'm believing? I'm believing that every game we add more people to this, that more people are getting involved. Well, this is the last game. I went from four to eight of them. And what I wish, I so wish I would have filmed it because these eight got together, but then football players over here started seeing them and they started actually, this is prophetic of the kingdom, they started running towards them, and they started gra gathering around the outside and putting their hands on them. Wow. And in the last eight weeks, we've had now seven football players come to Christ. <laughs> the reason I tell you this is these aren't spiritual giants. These are people that have been saved for like a couple months, but they're getting together and praying, God, won't you move, won't you change the Actually, they've won some games too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this, this, these are high school students that are getting together and saying, oh God of heaven, I come before your throne. Won't you change my friends? And one after another after another are coming to faith in Jesus. God wants to do this in your workplaces. He wants to do this in your schools. He wants to do this in your families. He wants to do this in your neighborhood. He's looking for people like Amos that would say, oh God, please spare these people. Pour out your love on them. And the Lord loves to answer the prayers of his adopted kids. Amen. Amen. Let me just give you a few practicals because I always want to give you some handrails what we can do to get there. Um, first of all, I announced it last week, but join with us in our three days of prayer and fasting, September 25th, 26th, and 27th. We're asking the Lord for permission to build, but we're also saying, let's take these three days to ask for personal breakthroughs. Like you need God to do something that only God can do. Maybe it's heal your body. Maybe it's heal your marriage. Maybe it's get you out of, of homelessness or, or help give you a job. I don't know what it is, but we're going to be asking for personal needs as well. But we're also going to be asking for our global workers, people that have been sent from this church all over the nations of the world. We're in every continent. And many of them are fighting the fight of their lives to advance the kingdom in those unreached places. And we're going to be praying for them. Oh God, won't you bring a breakthrough? Because they actually tell me, I can feel it when people pray. Here's a couple of more options to join us. Every Wednesday morning, we're meeting up until we actually get permission. We're meeting on Wednesday mornings from 7 to 7.30, a giant Zoom prayer meeting. You can go back to the back table after the service if you're interested in joining us, and they'll give you the Zoom link that you can pray from 7 to 7.30 with a bunch of us that are just asking God that he'd give us favor in the city, he'd give us permission to build, and God would move through this process Another prayer need we have is we have prayer pods. You can visit the, the small group kiosks outside. You can talk to one of our pastors if you want to join a group, these different groups that pray together, a little fight club that meets about half a dozen people that are meeting, contending, and praying. And I want to just tell you, these groups, God loves to answer the prayers of his saints. And so we're constantly seeing amazing answers 
to prayer. And lastly, our global workers need prayer. So we can connect you into one of their prayer teams that are praying for them. Maybe you're like, I'm not called to go to a different nation, but man, Paris is on my heart. Or goodness, South Africa, it's just burning in my heart. Or the Middle East, these global workers, they desperately need your intercession. Why don't we stand up?